morning. Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 11th meeting in 2015 of the Justice Committee? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices um, as the interview of broadcasting? Everyone has switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Alison McInnes, and I welcome Jenny Mara to the committee. Now, I move to item one. And did, did we, I'm inviting you to agree to consider item three on our approach to stage one consideration of inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths. Scotland Bill and item four on our approach to stage one consideration of the apologies. Scotland Bill in private. Are you agreed? Yes. Thank you. Item two. This is the main item of business. Now, final evidence session on the human trafficking and exploitation. Scotland Bill. Now, welcome to Katie Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Officials, and Oxley Criminal Law and Licensing Division. Kat Dug is it Dugan or Duggan? Duggan. Duggan. Uh, Child Protection Team Leader and Kevin Gibson, Directorate for Legal Services. Understand that the Cabinet Secretary wants to make a brief opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Convener, I'm more than happy just to go straight to questions that assist the committee with its business. You're just being too wooing us too strong these days. <laughs> We're getting suspicious. Um, right, questions, please. I'm looking. You see, you've got. You, they're not. It's they're not awake. We are. We've got John, and then we've got Margaret. And then we've got Roddy. Right. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, morning, panel. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, the relationship between immigration and the issues we're dealing with here, um, I'm, I'm trying to establish about the pecking order. Have you had, for instance, discussions with the UK Border Agency or any of the Home Office or anyone about your proposed legislation? About uh, the, the proposed legislation? Um, we have engaged with uh, the Home Office around the whole issue of uh, tackling human trafficking and exploitation. And uh, we've obviously been involved in discussions around the Modern Slavery Bill, uh, which was taken forward in the UK Parliament. So um, uh, there's a, a, a considerable level of dialogue that's taken place between uh, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government in the approaches which we're taking. And of course, um, uh, we've uh, gone for a UK-based uh, commissioner um, as well, uh, uh, which is provided for within the Modern Slavery Bill with uh, particular functions here uh, in Scotland. And also the National Referral Mechanism continues to be a UK-based uh, approach. So, yes, we do have uh, engagement with them and um, uh, we've had engagement around the provisions that we've got within our legislation. And do you have any concerns that in decisions that are made as to once, whether someone is a trafficked individual or not, that immigration, the immigration authorities have undue input to that decision making? Um, I, I'm not aware of any specific uh, concerns. Or obviously, if there were issues of concern around the way in which uh, the UK Border Agency were uh, dealing with particular issues that uh, came about as a result of individuals that we um, had identified as possibly being trafficked uh, within Scotland, then clearly we would uh, we would explore that with them. But I'm I'm not aware of any specific concerns at this particular point, uh, but we would certainly wish to pursue it with them if there was an issue it was identified. With regard to the possibility of children being trafficked, are you content that the Getting It Right for Every Child approach captures all of that, or should there be something further? I think the, the approach we've tried to take is very much that um, uh, you know, children who have been trafficked are uh, children first, and that is the whole uh, basis which underpins in making sure that children are treated um, as children first and get the right support and assistance that they require should they prove, prove to be uh, vulnerable. The approach we've taken in the, the legislation is to have a, a, a single offence. Uh, it's the same offence whether it applies to uh, a, a child or an adult. Um, and the reason in particular we've taken that approach is, is to... Um, uh, avoid getting into the potential difficulty which can occur with individuals who have been trafficked and that they may not have documentation. And you could get into a situation where it's unclear whether that person is 18 or over, when if you have two different, uh, uh, if you have two different um, uh, offences, one for a child and one for an adult, you then potentially get into the difficulty that uh, prosecutors then have to prove the age of that individual. Whereas by having a single offence, we are in a position where we can, uh, we can prosecute whether it's a child or uh, whether it's an adult if they've been uh, trafficked. So in that sense, I think it gives us a greater opportunity to secure convictions and to prosecutions as a result. Um, and I think the provisions which we have in Scotland through the various bits of legislation we have in protecting children um, through the name person, through 
uh, the child protection procedures where social workers are appointed as well, uh, provide a range of protections for children who may be identified as uh, being trafficked or uh, exploited, and the, uh, the bill helps to support that. I think it's important that there's cooperation within the United Kingdom and beyond, within the European Union and beyond. Um, it seems to me that um, awareness is an important issue. I, what plans, what can you... I don't to stop you, John, but I'd like to well, get... Well, you just have, Kabina, of course. Uh, in, no, I don't mm. want to stop everybody, but for the sake of writing the report, you know, you're going on to lots of topics, and I'd quite like us... Uh, um, was, when you did the stuff on the um, cooperation with the UK and immigration... And I'd quite like to know if anybody wants to get follow on to that. You've gone into children, now you're on to uh, you know, being awareness of it. Um, it's to really just follow through on one line uh, for the sake of mm -hmm. us being able to... Pro pro so, <coughs> can somebody get, I'll go back to you, but, because you've opened them up. MD with other things on immigration, NRM, so that we can get that all in one batch. Is that what your question's about, Roddy? That's what I'm trying to get at, so we keep to Roddy. Yes. <coughs> uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. The, uh, obviously, the Home Office received a report uh, reviewing NRM and uh, didn't deal with uh, the position of children in Scotland, but uh, I think there were matters when you last appeared before the committee you talked about the R NRM, which uh, was something that the Scottish Government would consider the impact of that review. Has, has thinking moved on in any way in terms of reviewing that recommendation, that the Oppenheim recommendation is on the NRM? Well, the review, um, uh, the review took place last year um, and uh, uh, it obviously highlighted an area, a number of areas where there was a a need for improvements in the way in which the, uh, uh, the national uh, uh, referral mechanism was uh, operating. One of the aspects of that was the, um, uh, the proposal to establish a Scottish panel, um, uh, or what was viewed as being as a regional panel, to consider uh, cases that are referred to the, uh, the NR. Um, and we believe that can help to give um, additional focus to uh, particular Scottish uh, cases. Um, we've, um, so we believe that's, that will help to support the way in which the NRM uh, is operating. I'm also very conscious that there are some stakeholders who would like to see a Scottish-only NRM. Um, uh, I'm not uh, opposed to that. I think we need to consider that in detail in terms of how it would operate and uh, the potential uh, impact it would have as well. Uh, but I think at this present stage, uh, the uh, establishment of uh, as was recommended from the Home Office review of regional panels and having a, a, a Scottish panel that would consider uh, uh, Scottish cases um, would be a helpful uh, way of helping to give greater focus on how the NRM is operating in Scotland. But nothing's been currently agreed with the Home Office at the present time? Uh, we're still in discussions with them around that and uh, we'll continue to be engaged with them around that. There are, uh, uh, my understanding from the Home Office, some uh, further areas of work that still have to be taken forward around the operation of the NRM. Um, I'd like to think we can get uh, these issues addressed uh, and resolved, but um, uh, I do think the, the specific Scottish panel may be a useful way of helping to make sure that it's operating more effectively in Scotland. Thank you. Margaret, do you want to come in the NRM? And Just you too, on Christian? a right. follow-up on, on that, Cabinet Secretary. Um, following the review, I, I think there's going to be two panels set up, um, or, or two pilots set up in West Yorkshire and South West um, <coughs> ACPO region. To look at the regional difference, would it be, um, would it be a suggestion or, or helpful to suggest that Scotland was also included as a pilot? to see how it was working regionally, because I think some of the concern was around the support services which are devolved here and making sure that there was a full understanding of, of how these worked, just the same as in different areas of um, England, there will be different regional um, support. Well, we're conscious of the two pilots that have been established by uh, the Home Office. What we have asked is to be kept informed of how they are progressing and how they are developing and operating mm -hmm. uh, in order to inform how we move forward here in Scotland. And that could include the possibility of having, as I say, a, a panel here in Scotland. My view is that I think it would be useful. Um, uh, the Home Office have chosen, uh, and it's for them to explain why they've chosen those particular areas for uh, having the panels, uh, the, 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 the pilots established. Uh, but we've asked to be kept informed so that that can uh, uh, help to assist us in looking at how we can make progress here in Scotland around how the NRM is operating. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm personally persuaded that I think uh, 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 a Scottish panel would be a helpful approach. 
Having said that, I am also, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm also open to the idea of whether there should be an NRM specifically operating in Scotland. But I think at the very least I'd like to try the panel approach to see whether that helps improve things sufficiently in Scotland uh, once these pilots have been completed. So it's not something that the, the Scottish Government would suggest was included, Scotland was included in as one of the pilots then? I'm, I don't know whether you're able to say, Anne, if there was a, any specific discussion with them about uh, establishing another uh, a, a, a right. pilot here in Scotland at the time when we were having dialogue, but I know that they decided on the two particular locations mm -hmm. that they wanted to have the NRM. I suspect part of it is in to do with um, numbers uh, of individuals who have been identified in order to test out that process. Yes, um, we have been in discussion with Home Office officials, both Northern Ireland and ourselves, about the NRM. Both Northern Ireland and Scotland have small numbers of victims. So, in discussions with Home Office, they identified the areas and said, Do you know, these were the two areas which they thought that they should test. Sorry? So, I'm just thinking, what was the, the pilots around? Is it West Shore? What were the places, those pilots? It's sort of Cornwall area, which is um, the ACPO police lead, Sean Sawyer's area. And West Yorkshire is the other Yeah, West area. Yorkshire. What are the difference in the figures between <coughs> West Yorkshire and the whole of Scotland? Well, in Scotland, there was only 55 victims identified in 2014. Uh -huh. West Yorkshire, what do we know? Offhand, I don't. I'm no, sorry. I just wondered if it's a numbers game, you know? No, it's not only a numbers game. There's also costs that come into it as well and the length of time the pilots are going to run. But there are two waves of pilots now. There's a second wave which will start during the summer. And we're in discussions with Home Office just now over that second wave. So that Scotland could perhaps be included in the second wave? Or it does it not, is it not viable with our numbers? It, I mean, is at it the numbers? moment, it isn't viable with our numbers to actually right. do a pilot. Uh -huh. And what they proposed was a joint pilot with Northern Ireland. Uh -huh. You know, but again, it still doesn't increase the numbers of victims potential victims that could be found. I think it would be helpful to know the, the numbers in the regions which are pilots okay. so we see what kind of critical mass we're talking about. We can get, we can get some more details from the Home yeah. Office for you. It is, it is principally an issue that's been taken forward by the Home Office, so, yeah. um, but we can certainly try and get some further information from them for you to assist you with that. I get the sense that the committee is quite interested in pursuing this and it might be something we can consider, we'll press further, but even in our report. Uh, because you say it's not a numbers game, but we're being told it's numbers. Um, that's the criteria. Um, I'm not blaming you. I'm just, uh, it's the point you've made. Okay, then. And, and I think we'd be looking at the fact it's the delivery of services. And there's other issues with the NRM that came up in questioning that it tends to be a tick box exercise, not victim centred. You know, there's culture as well as delivery of services uh, that, that was put to the committee. Um, so Christian, you wanted to come in there, I think. Or Yes, just to add into this, uh, Gavin is absolutely right. The, most of the evidence we got, what doesn't work is a and I am. So, you know, quite encouraged about piloting in, 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 in England, but I, I have not quite got the cabinet to really answer on this. Uh, would you go for a second round? Are you asking uh, to have a piloting in Scotland and in Scotland only just to uh, recognise uh, the evidence received at committee? and to recognise that uh, the NIM has got big failures here in Scotland as well. Well, as you've heard, part of the challenge is the number of cases that we have in Scotland at the present moment for testing that out. And um, I would, in the second wave, uh, the discussion we're going to be having, or we were having with the, the Home Office, is the scope for Scotland to actually host one of those pilots. Um, uh, there are issues around the number of cases which we have in being able to uh, to take a pilot forward. So, um, uh, my understanding is that the Home Office haven't finalised where the second wave uh, will uh, take place yet, and we'll continue to have a discussion with them on that to see whether there is uh, scope to establish one in Scotland. But there are, as I say, in terms of the Home Office taking this forward, uh, there are certain criteria they have around that that we have to explore with them to see whether Scotland would be a suitable location for it. Well, just to confirm, it's your intention that you want to have a piloting to happen in midsummer. Well, I think I would like to see, at the very least, uh, a Scottish-based panel, um, as was recommended. Uh, now, whether we are in a position to actually host one of the pilots 
is a matter for the Home Office because of the criteria that's been set around that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, given some of the concerns that have been raised about the national referral mechanism and the recommendation of moving to regional panels, I think having a regional panel here in Scotland would be useful and I would be supportive of that. Thank you, Kevin. It would be helpful to know what the full criteria is for the pilot, other than just numbers. If there's other criteria involved, then, then you know, be having a, a weight of numbers that makes it viable. If there's something else, um, John, can I come back to you because you went on? I would like you to go back to children, and then I want to ask others to come in on the children issue, so we can collect things, you know, for the report in, in an orderly fashion. John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, what I was going to ask Cabinet Secretary was about that there was a seat, there was the summit in October 2012. I'm from the policy memorandum here, and then there was a subsequent meeting in. Uh, of senior people in October last year. We're told about the anti-trafficking progress group um, and a series of 12 actions. I just wonder if it would be possible to get an update, in, uh, perhaps in writing on these actions, particularly relating to children would be interested in. Make sure we provide that to you if that would assist you in terms of the progress that's been made against those particular action points. I think uh, Kat's probably able to give you a bit of an insight. Do you have some details around them? It's particularly Definitely awareness I'm interested in, because the whole issue awareness. is about the raising awareness. It's all very well if we put in legislation, but if people don't understand the signs and symptoms, that would be... Well, I'm happy for us to provide that around the, uh, the awareness stuff in particular. Thank you. Right, could I have any other questions on uh, the way the bill deals with the issue of children? I know the issues have been raised with us. Uh, Christian, and then Elaine, then Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, again. Just a quick one on this one. I know a lot of uh, evidence received said that we wanted something specific for children, and here's the answer you give. I just wanted to know if at any point in the bill you're thinking about doing something about children, would you think as well about adults with learning difficulties who could have the same uh, problem, the amount of problem, or will need the same kind of support? And uh, we, we've seen in, when, in our visiting, in our visits, and uh, as evidence we took, that uh, there are some adults who are very vulnerable as well. Of course, um, um, no, I'm more than happy to, to, to consider that. There are, of, of course, um, uh, obligations on local authorities that if there is a, a vulnerable adult, including those who have a learning disability, to uh, make certain provisions available to them to provide them with the support and assistance um, as is required. Uh, as I mentioned in the approach we've tried to take with the bill is to treat the children as uh, that are being trafficked as children, first of all, and to uh, make sure that the uh, legislative requ uh, responsibilities that uh, local authorities have towards children um, are provided to those children who uh, are being trafficked. So that's the approach we've, we've sought to take with the bill and also having it as one single um, offence. Uh, but I'm certainly more than happy to, to explore whether there's anything further uh, that may be necessary in order to um, help to address any concerns that are around the uh, provisions in the bill. There are aspects, uh, further aspects that we believe can be pursued around children uh, that may be best placed within the strategy. Uh, which will be taken forward around some of the requirements and expectations of local authorities within the existing legislative provisions, which uh, are there for uh, vulnerable children uh, and children that may need to be supported. And I'm more than happy to consider whether that might be another route that would be uh, appropriate for those with uh, a learning disability. Thank you. Elaine. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of, of uh, children, uh, some witnesses felt there would be merit in actually referencing the support and assistance, the, which is actually now currently legally required, actually putting that onto the face of the bill and cross-referencing cross what is, is uh, required to be provided for children. Uh, would you have any merit in doing that? Do you think there's I think, um, some clarity in actually putting that onto the bill? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we have a whole range of legislation in place <laughs> to help to support children, which is already provided mm. for. Um, and uh, although the bill doesn't specifically make reference to that, these are all, uh, you know, if a child is found uh, to be trafficked, there is a, uh, a need for uh, uh, local authorities to provide support and assistance particularly for a child that's vulnerable, the child protection procedures uh, uh, kick in and the process that then operates off that. Um, uh, and I, I don't think there's a need to repeat what's already in legislation in this piece of legislation itself. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to um, considering whether there's a way in which uh, it could provide further reassurance that that's what the intention is, that the child protection and the 
uh, child support provisions and legislation we already have is what would be used for the purpose of a, a child to be subject to trafficking. And um, uh, we've already had some discussions with stakeholders um, uh, around uh, what, uh, what their view would be in that issue. And I know you've heard some evidence as a, uh, as a committee as well. So I, I'm open to consider, although I think a, a large part of that uh, would largely be dealt with within the actual strategy in itself, setting out much more clearly uh, what would be expected of local authorities in these instances with the existing legislative provisions which we have in place uh, for supporting vulnerable children. Yes, the, uh, James Wolfe, the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, had a concern about the drafting of Section 8.1, which seems to apply that it is Scottish ministers who have to secure for the adult the provision of such support and assistance as they consider necessary for the adult's needs. And I think he pointed out that um, other agencies would obviously be involved in doing that. Do you feel that's a problem with the drafting or, or is there some way in which that wider requirement to provide support is actually encompassed? I think it's a case of the, 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 the legislative provisions for dealing with the children are already in place. Yes, um, exactly. uh, it, it may be that that's an issue that would be better addressed with, again in the strategy. So we're very clear about that and what the requirements for local authorities are at that particular uh, point. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm not entirely clear where what benefit they would be having, mm. would have in having something on the face of the bill itself. Uh, because of the detail of what we would intend to put in a strategy for local authorities. So um, uh, I'm at this stage of the view that it would be better dealt with within the strategy rather than I the think, face I think of the his bill. concern was more, I mean, it's sort of parallel in terms of the support and guidance for adults, which isn't necessarily in legislation at the moment, that the way in which that section is drafted implies that Scottish ministers are required to provide that support and guidance rather than other agencies, or do you, yeah. do you feel that's a drafting issue? I'm certainly happy to take that away and to consider that issue. Um, but I think the general, uh, the general issue behind it, I think it's probably something to be better dealt with within the actual strategy itself. Jenny. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. On the issue of um, children, you, you've just said that Scotland has existing uh, legislation. I think you're possibly referring to the three main children acts, including the, the, the 95 Act. But there have been a lot of concerns right from the start of this process from all the stakeholders, I, I, I think, involved in trafficking, that children are not on the face of the bill. Can you tell me precisely how these three pieces of legislation work together that gives you confidence that children shouldn't be on the face of the bill, that these provisions are there? How does that work? Well, let's take, for example, if a, a child is identified as being... Well, for example, under the uh, most recent legislation uh, which we've taken for the uh, Children and Young People's uh, Act, uh, a child has a, uh, an entitlement to uh, an in-person uh, to be appointed for them as well. So if you had a child um, who'd been trafficked in Scotland, they would be entitled to having an in-person uh, uh, to be appointed for them. If they're identified as being vulnerable, uh, you're then in a position where uh, the, uh, the child protection procedures uh, then operate and a social worker is appointed for that particular individual as well uh, to have oversight of their needs and any measures that have to be taken forward. Uh, so there's, uh, those uh, bits of legislation all make different provisions for children in uh, particular sets of circumstances. And I think uh, there may be some issues around operational aspects and how local authorities respond to some matters. But I think the legislative provisions are quite clear in terms of the types of protections and supports that they would provide to children, whether it be a named person or whether it be a social worker uh, being appointed if the individual is vulnerable, uh, which uh, for a child who had been trafficked uh, would give them uh, two individuals who would have a responsibility in looking at their needs and the support and assistance that they may require. Okay. Thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, I think you would probably agree with me that named person is not nearly as strong as guardianship. And the absence of guardianship is, is also concerning, especially given the fact that England, Wales and Northern Ireland have that provision as well. Does that not concern you? Yeah, well, the difference is in England and Wales, we don't have a, an in-person arrangement the way in which we have in Scotland. So the, the childcare arrangements we have um, are not directly comparable. We've taken uh, slightly different approaches uh, to that. I think um, I, I'm very conscious that the Scottish Guardian Service uh, uh, provide a very, uh, a very important role and supportive role, particularly to those children who 
are asylum seekers who um, uh, arrive in Scotland on their own. And I think there are uh, clearly some uh, areas where that may be appropriate for uh, children who have uh, been trafficked as well. Uh, uh, what I'm also conscious of is that if you have a named person and if they're vulnerable, that you have a social worker, that if you introduce a third person, is that there's a potential for conflict uh, and there's a potential for confusion around who has got the lead responsibility uh, in order to deal with that particular uh, child's uh, needs. But I'm, you know, I'm open to looking at how we can strengthen provisions to make sure that children are getting the right type of support at the right time when they are vulnerable, and if there's means in the bill in which to uh, achieve that. Um, and in some cases, that might be that uh, a guardian should be appointed. In other cases, it may not be uh, because of the provisions that we already have in place. So I'm very open to exploring it and how we can improve on it. But I do think we've got robust measures in place at the present time in Scotland, which are different from the approach that they have uh, in England and Wales. I mean, you say you don't want confusion, but you've already cited two people who would be involved, the named person and, and the social worker. But I, I was keen to know if you thought the named person arrangement was actually as strong as guardianship. I, I think most of the stakeholders, most people who are involved with victims of human trafficking, feel that it's not nearly as strong, that victims of human trafficking who end up in our country under these horrific circumstances deserve the strongest support the state can give them, especially as children. Well, do you, do you not agree? Well, if they're vulnerable as well, they're also going to have a social worker appointed to under a child protection. But not a guardian. Well, under a child protection, uh, 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 responsibilities and legislation they have a, a clear responsibility in dealing with any support and assistance that that child may require. So... There are two individuals uh, who have a clear role in meeting their needs uh, and addressing their needs and also coordinating services in order to meet their needs, in particular for the named person to be facilitating that particular uh, role. I don't know, is your suggestion that we should remove the named person and it should be a guardian that's appointed instead of a named person for someone who's trafficked? I think certainly a lot of the uh, stakeholders um, preferred a, a guardianship model because it, it is more robust and, and gives uh, children that, that, that better uh, standard of protection through, through the ordeal. I, th I think that's been the general consensus. It, also, the evidence from, from COSLA, in COSLA's written submission, seemed to suggest there was a resource issue with that. I would be very concerned if the Scottish Government was stepping back from giving trafficked children a guardian because it was a matter of finance. Well, I, you know, obviously COSLA don't explain their own position in that matter. I think what we'd have to be very clear about is uh, what would the guardian do different to what uh, an in person or the social worker would do? What exactly different would they do? What, what, what would be the difference? Well, I think there's much more statutory, but I mean, I presume your civil servants have, have investigated that and you've decided that well, a that, person... Well, that's what I'm saying we I have. I mean, my understanding of a named person is it can be a head teacher or it can be somebody in a school. I think people have enough to do. A guardian is a specifically appointed person by the state to see um, this vulnerable person through their ordeal. Well, it's worth keeping in mind is that a named person for someone who is a trafficked child who's been identified is going to be someone who is relevant to the needs to meet that particular child's uh, needs as well. But I, I think we'd have to be very clear about if you were, if you were to introduce a third uh, tier of support to that child, what specific added value would it provide for that particular child's needs? So I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I don't recognise in some instances it might be the right thing to do. I think to apply it universally might not be uh, in particular circumstances, uh, but there may be particular children where a guardian might be the best choice. And it may be for the named person and the social worker who's appointed if the child is vulnerable, who would determine whether that's what should be done for that particular child in order to meet their needs. So I think we have to... Uh, we just have to be careful that we don't get into a situation of saying, right, every child who's been trafficked must have a guardian appointed, irrespective of circumstances. As it may be, there's a need to consider in what circumstances that would be appropriate. And the person who might be best to lead that would be the named person alongs alongside the social worker who's been appointed uh, to meet the child's needs. So I think we just have to, uh, we have to be careful in that... Um, the, 
we, we, if we make any additional provision, that we do so that will have a clear added benefit in meeting the child's needs, rather than doing it on the basis that a guardian sounds better than a named person. Well, it's not that it sounds better, but if the children's organisations were to make a detailed case to you, would you consider inserting at stage two? Well, well, can, I, can I say, Jenny, I, I mean, I think we've had a, a full debate. I'm not suppressing because I know that this will come up at stage two. There will be more debate. Uh, we've had your tested it fully. Minister's given his responses. So I really want to get on to other bits of the bill. But, I, I, but the bit that hasn't been asked as well in dealing with children is a presumption of age. Mm on the face of the bill. Now, uh, uh, James Wolf QC, Dean of Faculty, uh, quoted, because he seems to know back to front EU directives, as he should, and he said that member states shall ensure where the age of a person subject to trafficking in human beings is uncertain and there are reasons to believe that the person is a child. That person is presumed to be a child in order to receive immediate access, and this is key to what's been raised before, assistance, support and protection in accordance with Articles 14 and 15, whether they've got a guardian appointed or a named person or whatever you know, they're entitled to. Should we have, because the evidence to the committee often is that people don't know themselves what age they are, they don't have documents, but should there be on the face of the bill a presumption of age clause that would assist those agencies to work with um, victims of trafficking? So the, the present arrangements are that uh, for a local authority, if um, uh, they're unsure about the age of uh, an individual, uh, but they believe them to be a child, is that under GIRFIC is that they provide them with childcare services. So, and they should respond to their needs uh, on that basis. Uh, so that's the general approach which local authorities take at the present time for individuals where they are uncertain about their age, but they believe that they may be a child, is that they should uh, respond to the use of uh, uh, child uh, uh, care provisions um, as well. I think it's, um, uh, uh, there's, uh, there is a, a potential unintended consequence as well around the presumption element as well that uh, someone who uh, uh, we are unsure about their age, but they may claim to be a child, is that they would then uh, be placed in childcare services, which in some cases might not be the right thing to do um, uh, if they claim but they're not able to evidence that they are not a child, um, uh, that uh, if there was a presumption as well, uh, which could potentially have uh, risks to uh, uh, children. So I think... Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of the evidence that you've received from uh, the faculty in this particular issue. Uh, and uh, what we are going to do is consider at stage two where there are further measures that we could take to try and clarify this area uh, further. Um, but there are some potential unintended consequences which we need to work through, first of all, uh, in order to make sure we've got the right safeguards in place. Actually, the, some of the evidence I'm looking at here from the Child Protection Committee Chairs Forum was that young people pretend to be older than they are quite often um, rather than pretend to be younger. Um, are you saying it would be counterproductive that, that if there's a presumption that you're a child that that might be that people would play the game, as it were? Which, which, is, the reason, which is part of the reason why, under GERFIC, the requirement is for local authorities that where they believe that the although they may claim to be over 18, if they suspect that they are under 18, is to actually provide their services through their childcare uh, approach um, as well. Part of the challenge is obviously is very often uh, individuals in these circumstances may not have documentation or documentation that's not reliable about their age as well. There is also the risk of those who are over 18 to claim that they are under 18. And uh, if local authorities say, for example, um, believed that they were over 18, but they were claiming uh, that they weren't and they had no documentation to prove otherwise, then they would be required to then start to meet their needs through childcare services if there was a presumption. Um, if, uh, uh, so that's why I think, uh, and there's a risk that then creates for children who are making use of these childcare uh, provisions as well. So that's why I think uh, in considering this issue and the issues that have been raised by the faculty, we want to take a wee bit of time to work through some of those potential uh, unintended consequences that could arise um, uh, before uh, considering putting in a, a, a presumption um, uh, of age within the legislation itself. So uh, I'm open to looking at it, but we need to work through some of those potential unintended consequences. So your mind's not closed, though, to it. There's a, there's, it's... 
I, I can see I can see the benefits of it as well. Okay. Uh, we just want to work through some of the potential unintended consequences, which were the reason why we didn't have it in the bill in the first place. And will the, the will there be some movement by the time we get to stage two on this um, issue? Do you think, in terms of timing, or are we looking at stage three? I would certainly like to try and do so. Thank you. Uh, Elaine, Margaret, you, John, you, yeah, what was your third? No, no, that was covered, strand. thank you. No, it was about getting <laughs> clarification on these uh, issues. Margaret, are you on a different issue yes. entirely now, Margaret? Yes. On um, strategy defence, uh, Cabinet Secretary, are you in favour of this going on the face of the bill to augment, crucially not to replace, the Lord Advocate's instruction on the basis that this would give added protection and also on the basis, um, as I think uh, James Wolfe said, that if, if we didn't have it, it might leave in a, uh, to a situation in Scotland where um, victims, including child victims of trafficking, were less well protected. Well, I know that you had um, fairly extensive uh, evidence from Lord Advocate on this very issue last week. And having considered it, I thought he made a very strong case for the approach that we've set out in the bill and not having the um, uh, statutory uh, defence on the face of uh, the bill. I think he went as far as saying is that he felt that taking an approach that had it on the face of the bill could potentially result in injustices actually taking uh, uh, place. I think it's worth um, uh, keeping in mind is that in creating the, the statutory defence is that there's then, a, uh, uh, there's then an obligation uh, on the individual to uh, demonstrate that they have been trafficked and that that has resulted in them uh, committing the offence. And the approach we have tried to take is much more of a, a victim-centred approach, which is that um, there's not a requirement for victims to self-identify or to, um, uh, 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 or to, uh, or to uh, highlight issues themselves, that it allows us to, and it allows prosecutors uh, to be able to pursue cases where they uh, believe it, uh, it is the right thing to do and that they can consider the evidence uh, that led to the offence uh, by the individual and to consider whether they um, have been trafficked. And I think from what you heard from the Lord Advocate, it gives us greater flexibility and be able to respond to those individual uh, cases much more effectively. And, uh, and his evidence he highlighted that it gives them the opportunity to look at abandoning cases and also to uh, look at setting aside uh, any um, uh, any particular uh, uh, sentences as well, re to request that sentences are set aside. Uh, so uh, I, I think the, the approach that we've set out is one which is much more victim-centred. It doesn't place the obligation on the victim uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, to the court that they committed their offence on the basis of uh, their status has been uh, trafficked. Uh, and instead, it allows, through the approach that we've set out for the Lord Advocate, to issue guidance um, or instruction, as the committee raised with them last week, where uh, they will take an intelligence-based approach, that they will consider the information that they've received at the Crown uh, from uh, the police and from other parties about a given individual, and they can make a judgment on that basis uh, about whether someone should then be uh, prosecuted. And in that sense, it gives us uh, a much more, I believe, uh, victim-centred approach and greater flexibility uh, to, uh, to address any concerns there are uh, that an individual who's been trafficked has committed offence as a result. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not suggesting it's an either-or, Cabinet Secretary. I think the, the approach is, is excellent that the, the, um, the Lord Advocate is suggesting, but this is an additional... Um, protection, if you like, and tool in the box for those victims who, you know, uh, in the initial um, uh, assessment might not be looked at as trafficking. Therefore, they are less likely to come forward to the organisation, i.e. the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service, that has said, we don't think you were trafficked, if they, they then are in possession of some information that might support their case. And in fact, I think when the Home Office looked at it in England, one of the reasons for giving the statutory defence is that it gave victims the confidence to come forward and give evidence against traffickers. And this is on the back of, um, I think, the uh, Equality Commission's follow-up report on trafficking, where victims' agencies said, despite guidance, then they felt people were still being prosecuted um, where they shouldn't be. <laughs> 
Well, um, I understand that. I do think the approach that um, uh, has been set out by the Lord Advocate, I think, um, uh, you know, also helps to reduce the potential for injustices taking place, as he, uh, as he offered up in his evidence to the committee uh, last week. And it does provide a level of flexibility in individual circumstances for the, uh, for the Crown uh, not to pursue cases, to abandon them, and also to look at setting aside uh, convictions. I think it just provides that level of flexibility. Uh, uh, which uh, is much more victim-focused. Uh, and I would um, I think it's also, because uh, the other part I look at this is that it places obligation on the victim to then demonstrate, not just to, uh, to the Crown, but to the court, that the purpose for which they committed their offence is because of the circumstances in which they found themselves as being trafficked. Uh, and that would obviously have to be, uh, uh, that would obviously have to be done uh, and made known prior to the case going to court. Um, uh, whereas the approach that, uh, uh, that we intend to take is one where um, the Crown, along with others, uh, could look at the intelligence which they have relating to a particular individual circumstances and make a judgment based on that. And um, in the evidence to you last week, uh, the Lord Advocate's open to the idea as to whether that should be instructions rather than guidance, so that there is a uh, there's a stronger emphasis to that, but I do think it's um, uh, I, I think it's a pragmatic approach to it, and a much more victim-centred approach to it than having it uh, a, a statutory defence on the face of the bill. But if there was some merit in added protection, is that something that could be looked at at stage two, providing the statutory defence, given that for some people, even though the onus is on them, that might be their preferred way to to go give some confidence to come forward? Of, of course, it's open to anyone to bring forward an amendment to deliver a, a, a statute of defence. I think the approach that we believe it, it, that is the most appropriate route is, the, is the, the, the approach we've set out in the bill and also that you heard from the Lord Advocate last week on. Is it something you would rule out completely, though? Um, I, I believe that the, the approach that we've set out is what I think is a favoured approach uh, from my perspective and from the Scottish Government's perspective as well. But I'm open to the issue of looking at moving it towards instruction rather than guidance, as the, as the Lord Advocate said last week. Disappointing, Cabinet Secretary. Roderick, um, and then Christian, yeah, then just, Jenny. Just a couple of... On the uh, same thing. A couple of brief po points on that. Um, I think it's fair to say the Lord Advocate last week did draw attention to problems with statutory defences in terms of the principle of fair notice being given um, to the Crown uh, the, uh, in terms of the, the defence which was being lodged by um, an alleged victim, so that there, there was, was a downside to the statutory defence point, uh, and also kind of a feeling that shouldn't be over-egged even in the modern slavery bill when it's exempted from about 130 uh, offences. Um, but he, I think he also referred to the fact he wasn't aware that there were any prosecution um, guidelines in relation to trafficking in England and Wales. Is that still, uh, is that your understanding too, or, um, that there are no guidelines? Uh, so when we talk about possibly having both, um, that in, in, in Scotland, in England and Wales, there are no guidelines? Well, that's still the case, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. We would have to check for you uh, to see whether that remains the case. Okay, thank you. Christian, uh, can I Yeah, I know. And what particular point about the obligation uh, uh, of, of, of people to defend their case? Uh, if, I would just want a clarification on that. If it's on the face, if you put it on the face of the bill, the statutory defense, will it be automatically an obligation for the victim to do it? Yes. Automatically? Good. There will be no, no... They would then be required to demonstrate um, that statutory defense. So, so when we're talking about putting it in both, uh, doesn't doesn't avoid that fact if you've got it in in the guidelines or instructions and as well on the face of the big the bill it doesn't avoid that fact but there's still an obligation on the well the, the guidelines that would be issued by the uh, by the lord advocate would have to be consistent with what was in the face of the bill so there's no way so, we can dampen but that, that idea but because you'd otherwise you create confusion if you've a provision for a statute of defense in the face of the bill and then you produce Lord Advocate guidelines that say otherwise, uh, prosecutors would then be left, well, what is it? Is it, is it the Lord Advocate's guidance or is it, is it the statute of defence? Yep. Uh, so if you put it in the face of the bill, you would have to have any guidance that was issued by the Lord Advocate to be consistent with that.
I was just trying to find, to, to explore the way that we could add in both ways without having the obligation. But with any of you, uh, you, 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 you can't see how it can be done. I, th I think it's, well, as I say, the, the, the purpose behind the approach that we've set out is that uh, it would be an intelligence-based approach that would be used by the Crown in determining whether they were going to prosecute someone who had been trafficked and who had committed an offence as a result. They would be able to consider that information and make a decision based upon that. Um, uh, e even during the course of the trial, if information came, uh, it, came to, uh, it came to their knowledge that they could at that point then decide, based on that, we're going to abandon the case. And I think there have been cases where that has happened. Uh, where the Crown have abandoned cases as a result of information that's been brought to them. Uh, the difference would be is with the statutory offence is that the obligation would be on uh, the individual themselves prior to the case going into court to set that down and for that then to be taken forward in the court. They would have to demonstrate uh, uh, that the obligation is then on them uh, rather than on the Crown having the flexibility to determine that uh, uh, as to where they actually even prosecute the individual. I wonder if that will have a, an effect on the time scales as well. Will, will the timeline will be a lot longer as a, as, a, as a result if it wasn't statutory? If there was a statutory defence? Yeah. Uh, well, in terms of time scale, my understanding in terms of the legal process is there would be a requirement on the victim or the accused mm -hmm. to, uh, to lodge that defence prior to the case uh, uh, proceeding in court, so uh, there would be uh, there would be a requirement at that particular point, uh, and uh, that would have to be addressed at the uh, stage prior to it. Uh, it's difficult to say where it would mean. Yeah. You know, it's, it's difficult to say where it would add time to it or not. But it would be a requirement in terms of the process that has to be lodged prior to the case uh, starting in court. Thank you. Mr. I just think my way through this is. Because I found Lord Advocate persuasive, but I'm still not fixed. If you're saying the statutory defence on the face of the bill would be mandatory, if you're going to use it, you've got to use it. I mean, you can't. So I decide to not use the statutory defence, and therefore, um, because I, I, I don't use it, and I'm taken to court in a criminal case, during the course of that criminal case, um, I'm found, I realise, or the, the prosecution realises, I am a victim of trafficking, but I haven't used the statutory defence. How does that impact on the trial? I'll get Kevin maybe just to explain it. I just need to know how it works. Yeah. And the second one is, I use the statutory uh, defence, I decide to use it, but during the, cor <laughs> during the course of the trial, it turns out that I am, I am not uh, a victim at all. I just need to know how these two things operate, because the issue we're making is, can you have both, and how would they, if you had both, how would they, would they cause huge problems in a practical terms in the course of a trial? So the first is I, I don't use it, and then we find out that actually I am, and I realise I'm a victim. Well, I don't think it's correct to say that the defence is mandatory in the sense that if you are a victim, you must avail yourself of the defence. I think what we're saying is that... Right, so it's not mandatory, no, that's the first thing, no. right? No, if you do wish to use the defence, though, the obligation is on the accused, the victim... I understand that bit. Yeah, to, to, ..to raise some sort of evidential basis, and then it's for the Crown, essentially, to disprove the yes. accused's case on that point. But during the course of the criminal proceedings, which I'm no longer party because I've used my... It turns out that, in fact... My statutory defence was allowed wrongly, misguided. What happens? Well, it would be for the court or the jury to determine whether your defence is, uh, on the basis of the evidence that's been led by the Crown, whether the defence is rebutted or not. Yeah, yeah I understand that, yeah. but it's been rebutted, and they've said, yes, you've got this defence, you were a victim, you're not going to be part of it. But during other parts of a trial, it turns out that I'm actually a baddie as well. What happens then? Uh, and I'm not a victim. Is this if you've... You, if you've well, you're going to be prosecuted along with others, let's say, and uh -huh. you use the statutory defence that you're a victim of trafficking, right. and, the, and the jury... The prove, and, prove yes, and the Crown has to prove... I understand we've got to rebut it, but the jury then says, no, we think this person is a victim, so we'll not prosecute, you can't be part of it. But later, during the course of proceeding against others, it turns out that I'm in fact... So do I take it that then I could be prosecuted? Well, the Crown can appeal a conviction... So there would be, that route would be open to them. I'm in a muddle. <laughs> I'm in a total muddle about how this works in practice. I think now, I've got a lot of hands up. I've muddled everybody else up now. 
quite interesting if I can just add on that particular thing, which is to say, convener, that was very interesting. It's if uh, 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 it's not mandatory, then do you think that the consequences and put it in, putting it at a statutory, uh, statutory defense, which means that the victims will be less likely to ask for defense, uh, for statutory, for defense, when, when if it was not the guidelines, they'll be a lot freer to do, to do, to do, to do it or not. It's, Will, will that, in fact, have the contrary effect? I think I was getting that. Is if you don't use a statutory defence, does this prejudice you in any way? If it's sitting there on the face of the bill and you haven't used it, and during the course of the trial it turns out that, well, it's a, apparent to the Crown that this person is, in fact, a victim and shouldn't be up there on trial. So, so you does, that, a, does that make it harder or easier or whatever? Well, it would be a matter for the Crown to determine... Sorry? It would be a matter for the Crown to determine whether or not to abandon the prosecution on the basis of the new evidence... So it doesn't forward. matter that they I haven't used the statute of no, defence. No. Right. Jenny, I'll let Jenny in next and wait and I'll get the rest <coughs> in on this. On this as, uh, as well, yeah. convener, I mean, it's my understanding, perhaps you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that England, Wales and Northern Ireland have both guidelines, but they also have a statutory defence. It's also my understanding that our Crown Office in Scotland took the CPS's guidelines. And so I wanted to ask you, Cabinet Secretary, you know, um, if the other jurisdictions in, uh, across these islands, and we need to kind of work in a joint approach on this, felt that both guidelines and a statutory defence was needed, why have we decided that the guidelines are sufficient themselves? So we're going to clarify in terms of the guidance that has been issued by, uh, by the um, uh, Director of Public Prosecution in England uh, for, um, uh, uh, for offences being considered uh, there. What we've tried to do is we've tried to take an approach which is very much uh, victim-centred. It's also worth stating as well as that um, uh, the provisions... Um, uh, 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 we're trying to we're trying to take an approach which is very much victim centred to try and you know we're very conscious that these are individuals who will not be uh, most likely to self report and to self identify because of the very difficult circumstances in which they may okay. in which they may find themselves and to take an approach which draws away some of the added burden that is then caused by having a statutory defence provision within the actual legislation and allowing that to be dealt with in a much more flexible way by the Crown, along with other agencies, to consider that individual circumstances and whether they choose to prosecute or not. So, so I, we, are, we are seeking to try and take a more victim-centred approach and not to place added burden and add pressure to an individual who may find themselves in a very difficult set of circumstances uh, from which they have just been uh, they've been found. So your argument is that having a more victim-centred approach in Scotland results in not giving them a statutory defence. Well, I think what it does do is it gives more flexibility for the Crown to consider all of the circumstances and to take an intelligence-based approach to making a decision about whether a prosecution should take place or not. So, so are you it's to allow. Are you confident that the guidelines are not resulting in miscarriages of justice? Well. What I've said is that the Lord Advocate's indicated that he's prepared to take that to the point of it being instructions rather than guidance as well, so that it's very clear about what should happen in particular circumstances within the Crown. So it's about trying to, about trying to take some of the pressure away from the individual who's been identified as a victim uh, um, or been an accused individual who may, uh, because of the circumstances you know very well, uh, may not be inclined to identify who was at the root cause of their particular circumstances uh, for committing that offence. So to try and draw some of that away and to create some flexibility around making that decision. And that's why we've tried to take a much more victim-centred approach. And as the Lord Advocate his evidence said last week, he believes that, uh, uh, that, uh, that not taking an approach which is based on uh, guidance or instruction will potentially lead to um, injustices uh, taking place. He did say that, but he said immediately after that we would take our lead from Parliament as to the extent of any defence that was placed on the face of the bill. So it's my understanding that the Lord Advocate may still be open to a statutory defence. Well, of course, the, the, they're, going to, they're going to implement what's in legislation. That's not what he's... He's saying that if the, if the Parliament's decision is that you should have a statutory defence, 
we all have to operate that. But what he's clearly... Yeah, the I Lord think what, advocate, what he's... I, I, Lord I, has, I, bear I suspect, with me, Cabinet Secretary. A wee bit of a spin. I think we all appreciate it. The yeah, Lord Advocate think, has to temper I mean, the laws laid down I wouldn't be surprised if the Lord Advocate chooses to respond to that particular point <laughs> to the committee, because what he is he saying is it. that... The approach, uh, if you take a statute of defence approach, is that he believes that there is a potential for injustices to take place. Okay. Uh, yes. But by having guidance or instructions, he believes that gives yeah. greater flexibility. But of course, and I think you'd be keen to make sure that's the case, the Lord Advocate will implement whatever Parliament decides. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure that's what you agree he said to the committee last week. Yes, Cabinet Secretary, but I think are you... Can I just... Can, I'm sure you agree... That's what he said to the committee last week. I, I agree with what I, what I, I just read I think it's important out. we just clarify. Je Ms. Mara, well, hang on. Sorry, both don't... of you, both of you. Yeah. I get to, I get to quiet them both. Um, I think we must accept, Ms. Mara, that what the Lord yes. Advocate okay. said was he will obey whatever we pass in Parliament exactly. and statute. It'd be that to end see otherwise. of, as they say. So yeah. it's not a case of he's sitting there open to it. He put yeah. a very... Whether you agree with it or not, or we agree with it, he put a very persuasive argument from his point of view yeah. about the position that he wanted to have, which was discretion and so on. Right. Okay. Can we move to on? Just a final with you point. You and then if okay. others still want to come in, bear with me. Are you, all want, are you still want to come in on this? Yeah, just, just for the record. To, well, the... no, not this minute. Finish and then we'll come to you, Roddy. So there, finish a bit, Jenny, and then we'll come to you. Right? Can I say, finally on this, I mean, What's are you... Are you confident that the guidelines are sufficient? Because I asked you a, parliament, a written parliamentary question on this just a few weeks ago, and you said you didn't hold any records on, 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 these, on these elements. And, and secondly, are you, um, are you confident that the, rest, the other jurisdictions on these islands have, have taken evidence at length as well as we have and have decided that guidelines, which are exactly the same as ours, I believe Scotland and England have exactly the same guidelines, um, but they have decided they need that statutory defence as well. Are you confident that the guidelines alone are going to be sufficient given that other jurisdictions have gone for both? Well, I'll go back to the point I made earlier, and that is we're going to check in terms of the actual guidance that's been issued in England and Wales, uh, because as Roderick Campbell raised, there's issues about whether they have actually issued uh, a, 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 a guidance in that particular point. Of course, look... Secretary, I've got, a cabinet, I've got a committee member here who's about to explode, and I don't want exploding him here. So, Rod Campbell. I'm grateful to Cabinet Secretary for checking uh, the position, but the Lord Advocate said last week that he wasn't aware of any yet in terms of guidelines. So, I think uh, some clarity on the position rather than... Uh, so, I thought we were talking about instructions. So the point I'm making is we're going to check for the committee if there are uh, any guidelines that have been uh, issued as well. Of course, different jurisdictions in the UK uh, with different legal systems take different approaches to dealing with uh, uh, a variety of issues uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, that's not to say we're not trying to work together to achieve the same aim, uh, but take an approach which is distinctive to our own uh, uh, legal system here in Scotland. What I am confident of is that the approach that we've set out in Scotland is very much victim-centred. It is about trying to remove some of that onus and burden that's placed on uh, victims uh, who may have uh, committed an offence as a result of the situation that they find themselves in. And as I've already indicated, the Lord Advocate is prepared to step that guidance up from being guidance to instruction if that gives further assurance in terms of the approach that the Crown Office will take in this matter so there's much greater certainty that this is not something where they have a choice around, it's a clear instruction about what should happen in particular sets of circumstances. I think that's pretty exhaustive. Um, I'm, I'm exhausted, but Margaret, I'll let you do a short final one on this as you just, raised it. Just it absolutely be clear, I totally understand that you favour the child-centred report and the issue of instructions, but can we be clear that the putting a statutory defence on the face of the bill is not mutually exclusive. We could have both if the committee so decided and Parliament so decided. You're correct to say they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. And we could have both. That, yeah. well, that's, that, that's if we good. decided. That, 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 we've agreed they're not mutually exclusive. You've got your answer. I want to move on. There's lots of bits of the bill to be explored. Elaine. Yes, Chris, uh, with the issues of definitions, because the definition of trafficking in the bill uh, differs from that set out in the EU directive. Uh, we've had evidence that the definition, definition should coincide with what the EU directive says. I wondered why the EU definition hadn't been included in the bill. 
Well, the definition we've set out uh, for the new offences, uh, one which I mentioned earlier on, will apply to both uh, children and adults, and is designed in such a way as to cover uh, all forms of uh, potential exploitation. Um, we've tried to also draft the offence in such a way as to ensure that um, uh, trafficking activities which have been set out in the various international um, agreements, including the EU, EU Directive, um, are actually covered uh, within the uh, way in which we have uh, drafted our particular offence, and uh, also to do so in a way uh, that can uh, uh, assist us in bringing forward uh, prosecutions as well. Um, it's worth keeping in mind there's uh, the three elements that are often set out in international treaties about the uh, about um, uh, uh, about uh, pursuing issues around human trafficking about the. Uh, the act, the means and the purpose. Uh, what we have done with our definition is that um, where the, uh, the means uh, can't be uh, demonstrated to uh, a, a, a sufficiently high enough level uh, within a court of law, uh, that it allows us to continue to take forward a prosecution where both the, uh, where both the act and the purpose can be uh, demonstrated. In that sense, uh, this definition goes uh, uh, slightly wider uh, than some of the uh, some of the uh, international uh, treaties and the EU directive, uh, which is very much about the three elements uh, having to be demonstrated. So we have tried to take an approach that uh, uh, encapsulates, well, does encapsulate both adults and children, but at the same time uh, allows us to, uh, uh, it, where we can't demonstrate the means uh, sufficiently in court, still to be able to take forward a prosecution. So it goes slightly wider. Uh, than some of the provisions that are uh, recommended within the international yeah. treaties. There was a particular um, concern about the use of the word travel because there are individuals involved in the trafficking chain who don't actually facilitate or arrange travel but are still part of the trafficking process, if you like. Um, do you have a view on that, 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 that actually could exclude some of the offenders by this concentration actually on facil facilitation of travel? Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of some of the evidence that the committee has received on this, and uh, I'm sure the committee will also recognise there is a level of flexibility for uh, uh, member states and how they actually uh, define offences and taking forward the uh, provisions within the uh, that have been set out in EU uh, obligations, and that's why we have um, uh, got the provision around uh, travelling. It's worth keeping in mind in section one of the bill. Um, the uh, the uh, provision of travelling isn't about uh, criminalising uh, travelling in itself, but it's about the arrangements and the facilitation mm. of travel. Um, and that doesn't have mm. to be cross-border uh, in any way. There's a subtle difference to that, um, uh, which, again, allows us to uh, consider where there are individuals who have been involved in uh, the, uh, uh, the arrangement or the facilitation to uh, be prosecuted as well. So uh, it's about trying to give uh, a bit wider scope uh, around uh, how we can, those individuals that we can prosecute yeah. uh, in the whole traveller, uh, the whole traveller pathway, if you like, uh, the traffic pathway, mm -hmm. if you like, um, in order to uh, to uh, give us the greater flexibility and scope to prosecute these individuals. But for example, if somebody was not was involved, for example, in the incarceration of people who were being trafficked, wasn't actually involving them being tra transported either across borders or within a country, but actually was involved in so imprisoning the person, for example, or exploiting them some other way, would they be captured by this definition appropriately? As in facilitating or arranging, that would mm -hmm. give us the scope to be so able to do so. To it would give us the people. scope to be able to do so, yes. So, mm -hmm. again, it takes it in a slightly a slightly wider basis, uh, which uh, uh, increases the opportunity for individuals to be prosecuted. Mm. I, think I, I just think the concern is that the word travel dominates that section. And while, you know, uh, we're aware, obviously, from evidence and when we went out, about the num people go across many countries, sometimes for years. But I think there's also the point we made by my colleague here is that you can be in a flat and trafficked. You don't move anywhere from that flat. And I think while we accept that you've got tra transferring and exchange control of the person, it's the fact that the word travel occurs so often that it, it in a way blurs the fact that there's, there is trafficking without any movement of a person from a particular house even. 
Uh, and if there be another way of it being, perhaps, I think, mm -hmm. under the European directive, it makes it plain that these things can happen as well, rather than the way it's drafted. I think that's the issue. Um, I'm also conscious in your evidence you heard from Lord Advocate last week, and he addressed the issue of travel and how that would actually be uh, set around the, 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 the dictionary definition of travel uh, from one place to uh, another. The, the provisions within the bill, though, are around the three different elements, um, uh, both the Act and also the, uh, 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 the purpose for which will still allow for individuals to be uh, still allow for individuals to be um, uh, prosecuted. I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to consider whether there are ways in which you feel yes. that it could be clarified. I think we'd be happy. Um, uh, but I don't think having the term travel in there unduly causes uh, 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 it will make uh, make prosecutions any more difficult. Um, uh, but I'm more than happy to explore where the committee feels there's a way in which it could be <laughs> expressed or um, uh, 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 or provided for within the bill in a way that would help to address some of the concerns that you've received about yes, I think, it. I think generally the committee, um, if I may say so, I think you've all got concerns <coughs> about the way it's drafted in the definition from not only the, the evidence we've had throughout is that it, it distorts in a way what is happening to some people unintentionally, I think, and we very much welcome uh, a pretty strong review of that by a revising of that by the Cabinet Secretary and his officials um, to show that it isn't just the travel that, that does encompass a lot of things that happen to people within here and it's still trafficking and there's no travel involved whatsoever. Yeah, of course, these individuals are still being exploited. Um, uh, so yeah. uh, uh, cases can be pursued as well. But I'm, I'm more than happy to explore that to see where there's yeah. a way in which... In, um, be interested in hearing the views of the committee on that. I think it's pretty uh, unanimous. I, I think I'm getting nodding heads. We're not happy way. with this. Christian, do you want to say anything? On, on a particular word, travel, I, I think it's pretty unanimous. I, I, personally, I don't mind the word travel being there, but if you could have a canvas which says that it's not only about travel, it will be great. I, I want you to add something as a definition of the bill, but maybe wait. Uh, if you're coming to another definition, yes, I just want to deal with this particular section first, John. Thank you, too. I, I, I shared these concerns about travel. I have to say they were very largely set aside last week with what the Lord Advocate said, and I wonder if that would indeed be covered by some instruction as well, um, because he, he certainly said, read it out, paraphrased, if you like, as a lawyer would interpret it, a prosecutor would interpret it, yes. and that took some of my concerns away, but of course... He, might not, he will not be there for all time, so if that could be included in instructions... I oh, think that would be... surely not. You're already <laughs> reading the crystal ball about the lifespan of the Lord Advocate, or his professional lifespan. Life <laughs> I, I, should, I should just add, convener, that having been charged and why we've taken a different approach around a statute of defence in this particular bill is that um, in the, uh, the Modern Slavery Bill, they have the provision around travel. OK, well, we, we've expressed... It. There's another... You wanted to come in... Is this the same thing or a different section? Or less, more. It's just, it's just it's more section, or section less. Four, more. It's just a very quick point on it? section okay. four. Okay. We, um, cabinet secretary, we heard evidence last week. I think from the faculty of advocates, obviously, which I'm a member, should refer to my list of interest in that. Also from police Scotland and the Lord Advocate, that they thought um, the the question of consent. Um, should be included at section four. Do you agree with them on that point? Um, I do, and we're going to introduce that within uh, at stage two. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you're getting a tick from us here for that. But not a ticking <laughs> off, but a tick. It makes a change. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next one would be... Christian. Christian, are you still on to consent? This is No, I'm still on the definition of the, of the, of the offences of, uh, on the bill. Definition uh, of... Yeah, just a little point, the point that police Cotton argue that a reference to false criminality should be inserted as oh, a Oh, yeah, please, just ask that. We're not going on that, yes. Okay. You know, police Cotton did tell us that we would want uh, something to be... Uh, uh, separate and to be added, uh, which was a reference to forced criminality. And I just wanted to have your views on this. Yeah, we're more than happy to look at well as a way in which we can address that at stage two going forward. Um, uh, 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 and I think there's a, a reasonable point being made by them uh, uh, on this issue, but we're looking to see whether we can address those concerns. And put it on the face of the bill. Absolutely. And to make provisions that would help to address that. In terms of the exact detail of it, we're still working through or considering um, but um, uh, we're certainly prepared to look at that for stage we'll come two. Come back to us on that. Thank you. Just to, now, because 
we're all getting a bit excited, I think. So I've got Cam, um, got Gil, Roderick, then Elaine on new questions, new lines. Questions. So Gil, you're first. <laughs> Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we've heard that uh, criminalisation uh, of the purchase of sex would reduce uh, the numbers of people trafficked. Uh, but we've also heard uh, from other people that uh, because the complexities of the two issues, uh, trafficking and the uh, purchase of sex, uh, are so complex that they shouldn't be uh, combined. I wonder what your views on that matter are. Well, I'm conscious that this is a very complex area, um, both human trafficking and also issues around uh, prostitution. And I've um, uh, agreed to meet with uh, stakeholders who are on different sides of the particular uh, 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 the particular uh, uh, debate in this, this 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 matter. I think I I'm also mindful that to make a provision like this in the bill would require very careful consideration. Um, and would also require a lot of what I consider the need for uh, uh, detailed scrutiny um, as well. Uh, so I'm uh, at this stage, uh, uh, I want to listen to both the sets of stakeholders before coming to a final decision on this matter, but I'm uh, conscious of the complexities around this matter and the need to be very cautious in how you would take any of these, or how you would take uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, any proposal uh, forward. Uh, I'm also conscious that there are those stakeholders who have written to me who are not keen on having a provision like this within this particular piece of legislation as well, um, uh, uh, irrespective as to whether you agree with the issue or not. They just don't believe that this bill is the right place for that to be uh, dealt with. So um, before coming to a final decision on that, I want to listen to both the, state, the, the different groups of stakeholders uh, and then come to a, a position uh, uh, to prior to stage two in the matter? Uh, well, one of the issues that uh, many people have fears about is if, and it's on the principle of the purchase of uh, sex, uh, rather than you know, whether it should be in and out of the bill, and I hope that you take into consideration. I, I, I certainly have fears that by uh, bringing it into this bill, what actually happens is the opposite from what we're designing, that we in effect are trying to protect those that are, uh, and discover those that are uh, trafficked. But if you uh, um, criminalise the purchase of uh, sex, then what you do is drive it underground and find it very, very difficult to reach and people. Gil, can I halt you there? That's a statement of your views, which is fine, but you're not giving evidence to the committee. No, it's not a question. I, I, Okay, I'll, I'll In any event, the Cabinet well, Secretary has given a view, yeah, as I understand okay. it, that you are considering it, but that it may not be appropriate to put whether or not on its merits within this bill at this time. Well, it's not, if what you I'm just saying clarify. is that I'm prepared to listen to that, and I've agreed to meet with both sets of okay, stakeholders in order to hear their views, but I'm also very mindful of the fact that yes. even if you were minded to do it, there is a... Uh, yep. there is a, a, a significant level of opposition to being provided for within this within bill because of the change stage. in focus it would have on this particular piece of legislation. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm mindful of all of these issues and we as a government will come to a decision in that uh, for stage two. Uh, and I hope that, you know, yep. that, that will allow those stakeholders who are meeting I with me to, to, uh, to be assured that we haven't come to a final position on the matter as yet. Now, do you really need to ask anyone else? I think that on this particular thing, because the Cabinet Secretary has made its position. I, I thought from the Cabinet Secretary, but whatever Fine. happens, you'll come back to committee and making sure there'll be proper consultation about what... Well, it's also, yeah, you're going to say about stage two. Right, I'm moving on to Roderick. It's a separate question, separate I trust. Question. Excellent. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, we heard evidence from J uh, James Wolfe, the Faculty of Advocates, last week, uh, kind of uh, expanding on their faculty's written so, submission. I remind members that I don't allow electronic devices in here um, to be used, just in case anybody has one on. Roddy, on you go, please. Yeah, it's just a uh, technical point, raised particularly in relation to Section 10. Uh, no ground specified in the bill other than the provisions of security on which an innocent owner can regain possession of property. The faculties seem to be suggesting that sheriffs should have a wee bit more discretion. It seems to protect the rights of innocent owners. Is this something that the government will consider further 
Well, the, the, the approach of taking the bill, we feel there are sufficient safeguards in place. So, for example, um, uh, uh, the provision of security we see has been an important safeguard um, uh, in order to uh, for issues that may require forfeiture at some point. So there's going to be a level of uh, uh, security that would be required for that uh, to uh, be assured, uh, for example, if it's property uh, that may uh, be being considered for uh, forfeiture. Um, if there's no security, then there's a danger uh, that the court wouldn't be able to then pursue uh, forfeiture if that's what, it was, if that's what was uh, agreed. There's also provisions uh, where um, uh, uh, an individual who uh, would say, for example, they have property rights, uh, that, again, these are matters that would have to be considered with the court. So there's, the sheriff would have discretion around these matters. Uh, and also, when it gets to the point of forfeiture, there's also a requirement for uh, the sheriff to hear anyone who is uh, claiming a right uh, uh, to uh, to do so before they come to a decision on the matter. So there's a requirement for uh, for a sheriff to ensure that that uh, happens. So I think the security element is important, uh, uh, and the court will obviously determine that in individual circumstances what it considers being appropriate uh, in the way of security. And there's also provision that uh, if uh, for those who have uh, uh, or who are uh, claiming to have rights uh, on a particular element of property to be able to make representation to the sheriff uh, and for that to be considered. And also, if it's going to forfeiture, there's a requirement for the sheriff to uh, to hear any further claims that are coming from individuals uh, who uh, may wish to challenge that as well. So, um, uh, I'm, you know, I think the issue of security is important uh, in order for this provision to be effective. And I think there's a lot, enough discretion there for sheriffs to be able to determine those what's appropriate in individual circumstances. Thank you for that answer. Yes. Sorry, we're having a little debate here. We think the DPLR committee's made a mistake with one of the references because we've got a whiz kit here that spotted it. So you might want to ask about it now that you've spotted it. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> section 8 to B, and I think it's one rather than two, though the DPLR committee said two. Uh, there you are, you see, she's um, got it in for them. <laughs> the, there's, uh, they're suggesting that the regulations referred to in that section should be subject to affirmative rather than negative procedure. I wondered if your view on that would be. I well, won't fall out over an eye, but uh, um, <laughs> we're more than, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, more than half. It's not it's not very often that anybody gets to catch the DPLR committee out. They're always <laughs> catching government, so. That's very true. But uh, um, uh, we're more than uh, content to oh, take forward what's been recommended by the, uh, by the Delegated Pills uh, Committee and we'll, to make provisions at stage two to achieve that. Yeah, that's as well. Thank the, you. The, the other issue as well was uh, there are... Uh, surrounding sort of some of the general questions and the financial implications of the legislation and the allocation of funds uh, and monitoring costs incurred by bodies who there may be a lot of both, both public sector and third sector organisations providing support and assistance um, and there will be the need for things like joint training, uh, awareness raising materials and so on. Have you further information you can outline there as to how you would uh, allocate funds and so on? Okay. Well, I think there are a couple of aspects to this. Uh, the first aspect around uh, the funding uh, provisions, as we've uh, reflected in the uh, financial memorandum, uh, we do expect costs to rise as more victims mm. are identified as well. Uh, and part of that will be um, uh, as a result of the role of the reflection and recovery uh, uh, period uh, to help adult victims. And one of the things that we're going to do is be monitoring how that, uh, as that moves forward, to see what additional resource may be required in order to meet any increase in demand that occurs as a result. So that's an area we do expect there to be an increase in demand, and we'll monitor it in order to uh, to keep that under, um, uh, uh, to keep that um, uh, uh, with an overall view as well about whether there's a need for any further resource to help to support those uh, who are meeting this increased demand. Uh, and the second provision is around, um, uh, the second point you made was around uh, uh, material and training, etc. as well. There's already um, uh, training taking place um, uh, with uh, Police Scotland and NHS uh, Scotland, so there's already some materials and provisions in place. I know that some of the um, uh, uh, training toolkit that was developed by Police Scotland is also now being uh, utilised by local authorities um, uh, for, uh, for their training purposes uh, with staff. And I would exceed more. I would anticipate more of that taking place. 
a part of uh, the, uh, the the strategy will also be about that whole issue about um, uh, uh, training information uh, and uh, looking at how we can uh, support more of that work. And there's a, uh, 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 within the memorandum, the financial memorandum, uh, we estimate that there will be additional costs of between 100 to 250,000 pounds on that area of activity uh, going forward with the strategy. So we do expect there to be a need for further uh, uh, financial resource to assist in that uh, being rolled out more uh, across the public sector and also within the third sector as well. But how that will be done will be largely for an area uh, that will be covered within the strategy itself. Thank you. Jane. Thanks, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'm mindful of the discussions that took place as the Children and Young People's Bill went through the Parliament. There was lots of discussions about resources. Just, I'm talking about finance still, and the particular concerns about the numbers of health visitors and teachers in, in, in terms of delivering a named person function, and you referred earlier to the, the role that that named person function is going to have in, in taking forward this legislation. So I probably should know this, but do you think the Finance Committee has looked at that, about um, whether other legislation, other, other financial memorandum have been reviewed in the context of, of this legislation? Well, I'm not aware of whether the Finance Committee have looked at that. Um, I'm afraid uh, we can check, but I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether the Finance Committee have considered that. Uh, uh, but we can certainly check and come back Is to the Is it something that, that you're mindful of as, as, as we go forward? About the need for further resource for health visitors and for teachers around the... The all... name person, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm... I'm conscious I'm starting to stray out with my portfolio responsibilities <laughs> Sorry, and yeah, yeah. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Education <laughs> and Health may have something to say um, about that. But when I, uh, when I, uh, when I was a, a, a Health Minister, I uh, recognised the additional uh, responsibilities that go with being a named person and, uh, and the role that health visitors have to play in that. And that's why there were additional resources provided to increase the number of health visitors in Scotland. Uh, to, to assist in taking forward some of that uh, work. I think it's important that when provisions are made is that we continue to monitor them to see what impact they're actually having, both mm. in practical terms, uh, but also if there's financial uh, consequences yeah. coming about as a result of that, and for government to try and respond to that in as uh, supportive a way as it could. But on those two specific elements, they would be for my colleagues in yeah. health and education. Okay. Most importantly, Thank Gil, you. last uh, question. Just a quick one, uh, uh, line convener. It's with regards to the Commissioner. We've had lots of uh, concerns in regards to the fact that the Commissioner's uh, and uh, the role of the Commissioner is not in the face of the Bill. Do you have the powers to legislate in that regard, since it's a reserve matter? Uh, well, we've, we've taken an approach where we're having a, a, a UK-wide um, uh, Commissioner, which is provided for within the Modern Slavery Bill, and it was an LCM I agreed by Parliament for uh, that particular provision. There are elements within it in terms of uh, Scottish ministers being uh, part of the decision-making process for the appointment of uh, the Commissioner, uh, which who is appointed by the Home Secretary. Uh, and uh, there is also uh, specific provisions for the Commissioner to work in Scotland. I've met with the, uh, the, uh, the Commissioner uh, to discuss some of those issues. One of the areas I was keen to see happening, and I put to them is, that, uh, is to be engaging uh, with third sector organisations and uh, public sector organisations here in Scotland. I think there is a, a body of work that the Commissioner can take forward in that area, um, and, uh, uh, and he accepts that and recognises the need to, to do so. Uh, I'm also very conscious that, uh, uh, that uh, there is a danger that uh, in establishing a new commission is that they can become overly focused in a particular area. So it's important that the way in which they balance their workload and the approach that they've got uh, recognises the role that they play here in Scotland as well. Uh, and I've had that discussion with them about uh, working to make sure uh, that there is an, a balanced approach to the way in which the, the commissioner and, the, uh, and his staff uh, operate. And uh, he was keen to work with stakeholders here in Scotland and looking how they can develop that further. Yeah, that's fine. That's well, that's uh, Grant. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary and uh, uh, other uh, uh, witnesses. And thank you for attendance. Until the committee will do a draft stage one report on the bill at our next meeting on 21st April. And we've now agreed we move into private session. I'll have a little five minute uh, comfort break for everyone to, before we start looking at the rest of the business. Thank you.